just hit the record and I'll end up sharing my screen and taking over and going through the lecture. So we've got lecture today. Then what I want to do is do a bit of a pause and see if there's any questions and so on that you may have about the assignment that's coming up. I've received confirmation from the schools. So the Monday people, we will be going to St. Pat's in Fremantle and Tuesday people will be going to Our Lady of Mount Carmel in um, uh, Hilton. So just down south, off South Street. Oh, actually off Winterfold Road, I think it is. If you're near Seaton, it's literally across the other side of the road from Seaton. Okay, so that's good for us, isn't it? And we can go the three times. The schools have said that it's all good. So we get to go there and we're working with pre-primaries, year ones and year twos. So we will work all of that out over the next few weeks. All right, so I've got 40 people in. So I think I'll make a start. Others can just join in and I'm sure they will be able to see everything as we go through. Will you guys send me messages if my audio goes weird or if you can't see the videos and so on. If the videos don't work, what I'll do is I will just pop the links into the um, chat and then you'll be able to watch them later. So I'm giving it a go, but we'll see how it works. Okay. If it doesn't work, not a great drama for us. All right. So what I'll do is get this working. All right. And I will share my screen. Desktop one, share that. All right, not my emails. Zoom. All right, can you guys see the lecture? Is that okay? Yep, making sense. All right, so I will just move you all over there, make you go nice and big for me so I can see you all. All right, there we are. Now I can see lots of you. So this is our third lecture. So I've done one lecture live. I've done one lecture pre-recorded. I'm doing another one live. I'm going to ask you a little poll at the end of this as to which one you prefer. And so that will determine what we might do for the next few weeks. Okay. So we'll go with majority rules and we'll see how things work. So what we're doing to in today's lecture, let me just click in there or not let me just see what it's doing it won't let me advance okay there we go so what we're doing today we're looking at some pedagogies because remember last week we looked at the curriculum approaches this week we're looking at the pedagogies that accompany those curriculum approaches and the way that the curriculum approach gives you the why of things and the pedagogies give you the how it's actually going to be put into practice in a classroom. So we're looking at Reggio, a project approach, the Kathy Walker approach, an integrated approach and the Montessori approach. We're going to look at some elements of developing a personal philosophy and then I want to leave some time for assignment clarification. Is that okay? All right, so our pedagogical approaches, they're influenced by your curriculum approach. So you can't say that you're a Reggio school if your curriculum approach is a very segmented curriculum approach. You have to make sure that the two blend together. And that's why we've done these first so that you can then think, what will my philosophy be? So let's look at our first one. Reggio is the one that you see in a lot of early childhood centres. And a lot of them say we're Reggio, we're Reggio centre or we're Reggio inspired. Saying they're Reggio inspired is the more politically correct way to say it because Reggio Emilia is actually a city in Northern Italy. So they have a particular way of doing their early childhood education and it's very specific to their region and it's a beautiful blend of all of their environment, their people, their way of doing things. The elements of that will work in Australia, but elements of it are impossible because we're not a city in Northern Italy. So it focuses on the children aged three months to six years and it's based on the work of Piaget, Vygotsky and Dewey. Remember Dewey was one of our newer um, uh, theorists that we looked at last week. And the Reggio Emilia places a lot of importance on the child's relationships with each other with their educators and with their environment. So that idea of relationships is very important. Now, the way that it works 
is that you don't have a whole lot of curriculum that is pre-planned. So you wouldn't plan a whole term. You would look at planning a week or so at a time. And sometimes it's not even planned in advance at all. It's based around the needs of the children and it's based around their interests and it comes out of their questions and so on. And so you do with Reggio a lot of what we call post-programming or documentation after you've already done it. So that's why a lot of times it doesn't work in our Australian schools where we need to show our planning and we need to show and report on certain things. So schools will say they're Reggio inspired. They'll use lots of the beautiful natural materials and so on that you can see in those photos, but it's not, Reggio, it's not purely planned after it's already been done. It's very much based around projects that are initiated by the children and that's how they then start to work out what are they going to put out on the tables and so on. It's making sure the children are very active in their learning so they are not listening um, to teachers talk all the time. They're very much part of the learning process. The beautiful part when you start to investigate Reggio is they have this amazing focus on art. So you can see in the right hand photo, there's like the sunflowers and so on that you have as one of the pictures. Often they have a specialist room and a specialist teacher for art. And the way the children record their learning is so beautiful quite often. And again, that's something that a lot of our teachers in Australia are not as confident with. And the final dot point about Reggio is that the teacher acts as the recorder of the learning. So you hear the teacher say, tell me more about that. I'll just write that down. And you'll see her writing things down on post-it notes or writing things down in their special notebooks that they have and so on. So it's very much based around this idea of the children are leading the learning and the teacher is the support and the recognizer and the recorder of that learning. So it's got some very clear principles. We will explore those a little bit more in our tutorials as well. All right, so this is a YouTube video showing a Reggio classroom. So this is where I need you guys to help me see if it's actually going to work. All right, can you see that video popping up? Let me just see. No if... way, the hundred is there. All right. The child it's is It's working for you guys. The child has a hundred languages. A hundred yep. A hundred thoughts. A hundred ways of thinking. Of playing, of speaking. A hundred, always a hundred ways of. of listening. Of noveling. Of dubbing. A hundred joys. For singing and understanding. A hundred worlds to discover. A hundred worlds to invent. A hundred worlds to dream. The child has a hundred languages and a hundred, hundred, hundred more. But they steal 99. The school and the culture separate the head from the body. They tell the child to think without hands. To do without head. To listen. And not to speak. To understand. Without joy. To love and to marvel. Only at Easter and at Christmas. They tell the child to discover the world already there. And of the hundred, they steal 99. They tell the child that work and play, morality and fantasy, science and imagination, sky and earth, reason and dream, are things that do not belong together. And thus, they tell the child that the hundred is not there. The child says, no way, no way, no way, no way. The hundred is there. So that's a little explanation of some of the core beliefs of the Reggio. And it's about the hundred languages of the child. So you can explore that in a little bit more detail. Did that video work okay for everyone? You could hear it and see it? Brilliant. You always go on like the, I hope it works. <laughs> All right. So this is a beautiful Reggio inspired kindergarten that I did some supervision at last year. And so this is at a school in our northern suburbs, just a little school. And you can see the beautiful natural materials. You can see the way that the teacher has organized everything. The teacher is on Instagram. Her Instagram name is the magic of play. 
if you are interested in following her on Instagram. And she puts up beautiful, beautiful pictures of her room, but not the ones that I make fun of and say they're the Pinterest and the Instagram classrooms that are useless. Hers have a beautiful philosophy that runs through them as well. Can you see the artwork and the way that she has displayed it? It's just gorgeous what she does. So you'll be able to see there's lots of those. Now, let's have a quick look at one of our others. So Reggio is something you will find in lots and lots of schools. Our next one, this one I haven't done in a huge amount of detail because I find that Reggio takes the project approach and goes into it in more depth. So the project approach is based on the work of Dewey, which talks about how we need to depth a whole lot of things rather than looking at things from a very superficial level. It uses the interests of the child to start those investigations. And it's something that I find is gaining huge popularity in a lot of our schools. But I find that the project approach is actually being morphed into a Reggio or a Kath Walker or a different approach of some sort. So it's something that you might want to use your project approach. So obviously, again, it wouldn't go with a segmented curriculum. It'd be far more of a curriculum that is based around perhaps a thematic approach that then they can start to delve into in a great more depth. So the project approach is something that you will find in some schools, but not a huge amount of schools. Now, our next one is an integrated approach. Now, uh oh, I've got the spinning wheel of death, guys. <laughs> oh, it's all right, it's gone away. Um, the integrated approach is one that you will find in a lot of our early childhood centres and a lot of our, um, particularly our kindies and pre-primaries, where they take a theme and then they work a way to integrate that theme within lots of learning areas and domains. So you plan the theme and you think, right, how can it fit through lots of things? So I'll just go through, where is my, oh, spinning wheel. There we go. So for example, you take a topic like the farm and then you think about how would we do that in HASS, in English, in maths, in RE, in science and so on. Now, when you do assignment two, which is your planning for the three-year-olds that we are doing, you're going to have to do a concept map, which is kind of like this and it expands it out in a little bit more detail though. So we're going to use a style of that whole integrated approach to do some of our planning. So when you think about your integrated approach, the other thing that you want to consider is that you've got your learning areas, but you want to couple it with the domains as well. So you'll find that a lot of schools use an integrated approach. They might not verbalize that, but it's something that they will be using in their schools. Okay, so we've gone through our Reggio, our project approach, our integrated approach. Now our next one is one that we have quite a few schools around Australia, the Montessori. So has anyone been to a Montessori school or seen any Montessori stuff? Yep, few people have. I'm off to one this afternoon. One of the students at in fourth year is doing her internship at a Montessori school. So I get to spend the afternoon there. So I'll tell you all about it next week, okay? So a Montessori approach has some very particular ways of doing things. It's not an approach that you can just go and do in a classroom. Generally, what they do is there is, a, I think it's like a grad certificate that you do in Montessori teaching. So to be a qualified Montessori teacher, you do extra study on top of your standard teaching degree. So that's what this particular girl is going to do next year. She's going to get her, uh, finish her internship at the Montessori school, and then she's going to enroll and do the Montessori um, teaching. Uh, so I think it's four or eight units or something like that, that she's going to do because it has a very particular model that they use. So it relies on great mental concentration from the kids, the fact that children love repetition and love order. So it's very much built around those types of jobs that they do each morning, that blend of work and play. Um, it looks at an idea that the children have a lot of freedom of choice. We often hear Montessori kind of, I'll say made fun of, that you know the children don't learn anything and they don't do classes. They do, but it's very much based around what the child wants to do. So it works really well for kids who have difficulties with settling into standard schooling. It works on the premise that children prefer to work 
as well as play, but not work to play in the way that you think, you know, they're not going to send them out to work down the coal mines or anything like that, but it's that they are working as in they have a purpose for their play. They don't believe in rewards or punishments and you'll often see the children will refuse rewards. So you wouldn't use stickers, you wouldn't use tokens of any sort or, you know, little money charts or anything like that. Montessori classrooms are, they have large pockets of silence. It's amazing to watch. You just go in and they're just very quiet because they're all doing their individual work. And then other times they're very noisy. And it works on a premise that children have an innate desire to communicate and to read and to write. And I think that's very true, isn't it? So let's have a little look. I've got another video, um, just a simple one of a Montessori classroom. Uh, let's make this go. <coughs> the early childhood program includes children three through six years of age. This is the age of development of one's own independence mastery of one's own environment, as well as emerging awareness of social grace and courtesy. As the child enters a Montessori classroom, they are experiencing reality, the things they can actually see, touch, hear, feel and do themselves. The three-year-old is observing and absorbing his environment with a voracious hunger. He is driven to master all things that pertain to the care of themselves, such as putting on their own clothes, preparing food and cleaning. Their curiosity is in full bloom with cause and effect. Like how things open and close, what's inside a closed box, or what's on the other side of the door. Their awareness is keen on vocabulary using big words, silly words, rhyming words, and opposite words. The four-year-old is calm and serene as they begin to assimilate, organize, and apply the knowledge they've absorbed. The five-year-old is weaving together and organizing the skills of independence with emotional and social skills as they develop intellectually a true understanding of concepts in language, math, and science that will serve them for the rest of their lives. Montessori opens the doors of education and learning. It's a free and open system where children can gain a foundation that will benefit them the rest of their lives. Upon entering a Montessori three to six classroom environment, you immediately notice the small size of the furniture, the low elevation of the shelves, and the sense of accessibility of the child to their environment. This was the plan of Dr. Montessori, to prepare the environment to meet the physical needs of the child. To the unenlightened, the environment may appear homelike, with glass pitchers, bowls, brooms, aprons, and the like. Upon closer inspection, one begins to observe a beauty in the environment, with plants, art, animals and music, then emerges a subtle awareness of geometric shapes, numerals, letters, beautiful maps, colorful beads and books. What evolves in the observer is an awareness of a carefully prepared environment that engages the young child. It is inviting and appealing, creating a desire to explore and learn. A Montessori education actually creates the possibility for peace. The outcome of such an environment, paired with a well-trained, educated, and credentialed Montessori teacher, is a learning experience developed to meet the needs of the child. Children observed in the Montessori classroom are engaged in activities that best suit their own individual developmental needs. As children enter a Montessori classroom for the first time, they begin a journey that will facilitate the development and mastery of order and organization, which aids in the development of their coordination and concentration and ultimately empowers them as independent young people who are prepared to enter the world of elementary interdependence. At that time, the child will be prepared to become a part of a greater community. Bit of a salesy one, but I thought it was a nice little summary for you of the Montessori approach. Now you can find on YouTube quite a few other videos that are about the Montessori and they're great to see. I'll see if I can even capture some um, when I do my observations over this term so you can explore it and see it a little bit more. There's so many really cool things in the Montessori. Can you see that a lot of the things we will see in an early years room, like the tracing of the sand and the natural materials and so on, they've actually emerged out of a Montessori approach. So we have lots of those that have been put into the mainstream classrooms. Okay, our next one that is starting to gain a lot more momentum is our Kathy Walker approach. 
Now, Kathy Walker is an Australian um, woman. She's an amazing educator. And what she's been doing is she's worked out an action research model and it works on the way that you create provocation. So if you go into a classroom and they're talking about provocations that they're setting up for the young learners, more than likely they're using the Kathy Walker approach. So let's have a look at some of the key principles. She's working on the fact, and this is different, you can see straight away to the Reggio. She's saying that all teaching is intentional. So you have a plan, you have a purpose for doing it, but she's saying that not all children are ready to learn. Children's interests are used, not for the interest, but for engagement, that we use child development as a basis for our guiding practices. We make sure that our learning is personalized. We make sure that we are using intrinsic motivation so the kids want to learn. We have great adult child relationships. We ensure that learning is real, relevant and meaningful. So if you have a little look, these are a couple of photos from Instagram that are of those provocations. So if you do a search on Instagram for hashtag Walker Learning or work Walker Learning Approach, you'll be able to find lots of these provocations that different early years teachers are setting up and you'll find them all the way around Australia. So you can see in this one that they've got how do birds make their nests and you can see she's got a picture book about birds. She's got a lovely picture of birds plus she's got all the things for the children to be able to make and explore nests in some way so just a lovely provocation isn't it to get the kids thinking about things and it might have been because they observed a bird outside that was making a nest in their tree so that's where she's brought it in and you see those little um i don't I don't know if you call them barriers, but the little lattice, I often see those in classrooms as well. So they make a number of provocations around a room and the provocations are often with natural materials and so on. So if you have a look at this one, again, we've got lots of things where the kids can make, um, they're looking at natural materials and the impressions and the way that they uh, compress different things into the clay and so on. So just setting up the beautiful provocations on the table in some way. Now, I've got another video for you. I'll leave this video, I'll pop it into the um, links and send it through. This one is, actually, no, I will play it. I'll just play part of it. So you can actually get to see Kathy. Um, just tell me if this All this week, the play. circle is looking at schools is that are going above right? and beyond the standard ways of teaching and trying new ways of getting kids to love learning. Today, our mate George Backencrow checks out a program developed by renowned educationalist Kathy Walker. It's fascinating. Have a look. This may look like unstructured, chaotic play, but these children are all working on a very special investigation project and they all have lots of one-on-one -on -one time with their teachers. The Walker Learning Approach is about personalised learning. This means the kids choose a topic they love, then literacy and numeracy skills are brought back to their favourite topic. So investigation time has three very specific components to it. We always start the day with a very specific tuning in where we talk to our focused children. Maya, where do you think you might intend to start your investigations today? In the fruit shop. In the fruit shop. How much do you think they'll cost today? Five dollars. Five dollars for a pineapple and a banana. The children go off and begin their investigations and then at the end of each session they come back for their reflection time where we talk about the learning that has happened that morning. The class might look casual, but the teacher is skillfully relating the kids' experiences back to the literacy and numeracy curriculum. Personalised learning and student engagement is at the centre of this philosophy. You and I, if we're engaged and if it's real, relevant and meaningful to us, then we're more likely to be involved and to understand it. All schools claim pretty much that they have individual learning programs. How does this distinguish itself from that? It's very easy to put up a placard and say we value the individual and that we personalise learning and yet there's so many schools that we walk into and then you see 25 cloned daffodils, 25 children all doing the gold rush. So many teachers start their planning with the topic, whereas we start our planning with who is this child right now in front of us and what are our learning intentions. And who was this one? That's right. What number was that? Number 12. Now here he is. Right here. What are the stats on this? We've got 15 years of data okay. and we show that there's a quadrupling of oral language skills. There's an incredible 
improvement in the engagement of all children, particularly boys and particularly the hoons of the class. Right. Yes. And as you would expect, there's an inverse relationship with behavioural problems. If the child doesn't connect to the interests, if it's not something they want to know and need to know, then it's really much harder for them to learn. What's happened here, all children write. The same happens with the reading. They understand that reading is about making meaning. Right. It's not just barking at print. So true. Yeah. So what they do and they're just going through the numbers and yep, yep, yep. And yeah, well, you see, often children get stuck there mm. because they don't understand. You read for a person. Mm. Listen to me, listen to me. Says... Well, you see kids learning in this way where what they study comes from them, what they're interested in, and then it feeds back into other key learning areas. You can't help wonder, should this be the way all education goes? So it's interesting, isn't it? I thought that was just a nice little summary for you of it. All right, so they're our main pedagogical approaches that we would use in an early year centre or in a um, primary school. So let's have a look now. We've got curriculum approaches that inform things. We've got our pedagogical approaches that we put into practice in some way. And then we have to work out what is our personal philosophy? How do we take all of that information from our theorists, from our practical things that we're seeing and observing, and how do we build it into a personal philosophy? So you've got to think about what is your philosophy? Essentially, it's like your vision statement or your mission for you as a teacher. So you as an educator, what is your core beliefs? Now, at this point in your career, being two, maybe some of you are three years into your course, it's probably not very well formed yet. My core philosophy changed a lot as I was going through my career. So you want to think about these three things. And this might be a really good way for you to start writing your philosophy. So what is important to you? What do you believe about children? What do you believe about learning? What's important to you? And then what do you actually believe? So is it important that children are individuals? Is it important that every child feels happy? For me, every child feeling happy and safe at school, very important to me. Other people feel it's really important that children are learning. For me, I want them happy and safe, but it, it's not a right or a wrong. It's mine, what is important to me. Now, what do I believe? I believe that every child has a potential to achieve huge things, but that sometimes schooling, we help them and sometimes we stop them. So you have to think, what is your core beliefs about education, children, learning, teaching, um, your role as an educator, all those sorts of things. And then the third one to think about is, what do you actually value? If someone said to you, you have to pick one thing, what are you going to do in a classroom? Some people might say, teach them how to read. Some people might say, make them feel confident as humans. Some people might say, make them trust in other people. Some people might say to create a wonderful environment around them. So you have to think, what do you value? What's most important to you? And that's where it becomes part of your philosophy. Once you work out those three things, what's important? What do you believe? What do you value? Then you can go on to think, okay, how do I develop it? So it sits alongside your program. So you develop your program of what you're doing but it should be reflected. So it should inform and guide your planning in some way. Now, your philosophy, you'll regularly read and you'll look at it and go, oh, wow, no, I've learned so much more in the last couple of years of my first two years of teaching that has changed my personal philosophy. And as you advance in your career, so I started as an upper primary secondary teacher and then I went back and did my early childhood degree. So my philosophy about how children learn has dramatically changed over the process of my career because I've had all those different experiences. So when you think about your personal philosophy, these are some questions that might be good for you to start looking at. What's my image of the child? How does it influence my practice? So what do I think children need? What do I believe? What do I understand about them? How do they learn? How does the social and cultural context influence their development? And therefore, what am I going to do about it? What's my role? Is my role to facilitate learning? Is my role to tell them 
things? Is my role to set up the experiences? Is my role to provide the right environment? What's my role as an early childhood teacher? What do I believe about play? Do I believe, I know this is what we say in our rhetoric that play is important. Do you really believe it? Or is it something that you go, yes, but, and there's nothing wrong with having a personal philosophy. It's when your personal philosophy is in conflict with the philosophy of the center or the school that you're working at, that becomes a problem. What do I believe about my learning environment? Do I believe that I need to have a very uncluttered environment? Do I believe that children need lots and lots of stimulation? So therefore I'll have lots of color and lots of things up. I believe that at the beginning, now as I go through, I have much more of a Reggio and a Montessori approach where I love all the natural materials and so on. But that was not the way I started my teaching. And what's my role in building this idea of partnerships between myself and the community and the parents and the leadership in the school and so on? What's my role in building all of those? That can come into my personal philosophy as well. So some things to think about. It's a living document, therefore it's going to change. These things will shape it. Societal values, as I said, the Kathy Walker approach is becoming way more through than what I've seen in the last few years. It, it's really taking hold in a lot of schools. Research tells us certain things are better than others, yet so often teachers will ignore research. Contemporary theories, so we, we keep talking about Vygotsky. Vygotsky, it's not that there's anything wrong with him. It's that it's, that's not a contemporary theory. That's a theory from quite a while ago. So do we have other theories that are complementing it or even contradicting it? And of course, your personal growth will shape it as well. So if we think about our contemporary theories or perspectives, we've got Vygotsky, we've got Gardner. Now, that one, different people believe in different ways. We've got postmodernism, post-structuralism, we've got the new sociology of childhood, and we've got this idea of reconceptualizing movement. So these types of things are sometimes coming through all the way down into the early years, and sometimes they sit off to the peripherals of them, particularly the last couple under there. And so think, what do you want to do when you start to write your philosophy? So how do you start? Lee and I thought this would be a good process for you to think about. Have a look at your code of ethics. What do you have to do in Australia? All right, what are your non-negotiables? What's your early childhood Australia code of ethics? What's your early years learning framework, your principles and your practices? What does that say? Because that's our guide for things. Have a think. Is there a school or a centre philosophy that you can find? And we're going to be exploring lots of them in the tutorial today. Have a look at system policy. So look at the education department and the Catholic system and our ASWA system. But of most important, what do you genuinely believe about education and care? What does your core say? And that's where I wanted you to think as you start, started to write those key words last week, what do you really believe? What are your key words? And that might be a really good place to start. What are the key words that you have about education? So I think these things need to be addressed as well. How are you going to make sure that you address the issue of quality, that we have an awareness of different perspectives from different theorists and so on about childhood? And you really have to have some reflection time to think about what do you actually believe? You don't just want to go and pick a whole lot of buzzwords and just write them up because Lee and I will be able to see through that a mile away because what some people do, they literally find paragraphs of buzzwords and they put them all together, but it doesn't have a flow. It's all things that people think should be happening in early childhood, but it's not a genuine flow. Whereas I can see when somebody has a really core about environment and sustainability, and that comes through in their childhood, in their um, personal philosophy or when somebody really believes that we need to encourage great numeracy and literacy to have effective uh, citizens, that comes through in their personal philosophy. So what does your assignment need? You need to have an explanation of your personal philosophy, an explanation of possibly the curriculum approach or approaches that influence your choices. 
You need to think about an elaboration and integration of those pedagogical approaches. You need to have some research and have some references that complement your ideas. And you've got to have a personal point of view with some nice explanations for it. You've got 1500 words. It's not a massive amount, but it's also enough that you can do some good references. Lee and I were talking about how many references, and we thought that somewhere between three and five references would be nice. If you can do a couple more, that would be great. But every 500 words, you should have at least one reference. That's a general rule of thumb that you have. So that means three to potentially five, depending on what you're looking at. All right, so as a review, curriculum approaches are developed into pedagogies. Those pedagogies influence the planning and organization of our early years program. Our pedagogies could include the Montessori, Reggio, Kathy Walker, the integrated and other approaches that you might see in different centers and early years rooms. And your personal philosophy is a way of integrating and showcasing your personal beliefs in a nice short summary. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I am going to stop playing that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. All right, so I've got all of you back. Your daughter's teacher. Who was that? Ah, I've got somebody who's saying. Yep, here we go. That was um, uh, the, the oh, it's at Mother Teresa Catholic College. It is um, Wonder and Play in Early Childhood. Oh, brilliant. And yeah. she has beautiful provocations, doesn't oh, she? Oh, her classroom at the moment, they've just moved into a new classroom and it's absolutely beautiful. Yes, it's amazing. When And that's why I find good ones that you can find and so on. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. All right. So, my dears, um, what questions do we have about any of our things that you've got coming up? All right, any questions that you want to write in? Assignment okay, have you found the rubric? So rubric is sitting in the assessment tab in Blackboard and then I put it in the top part. I haven't made the Turnitin link active yet. That'll be active end of this week. I think I've set it for, okay. <laughs> Oh dear, there's a big dog's face I can see. <laughs> He's very cute. <laughs> He's just looking at everything. All right, any questions? Um, what kind of structure? Yes, Abby, like an essay would be great. So remember you've got the two parts to it that you have to give me the 1500 words kind of like an essay, but then we want a infographic of some sort that kind of summarizes it. And I thought that would be a nice thing to put onto your AITSL portfolio, even on the first page of it. Now your infographic, I've seen some really cute things that teachers have done. I've seen ones where you do like the picture of a child and then you have the keywords around it. It might be as simple as that. I've seen ones where they do a beautiful flower garden and you know, we all help our flowers grow and there's all the keywords and, and different um, phrases that you want to have. It could be a, you know, a pie chart with all the different things that you believe and how it could be a recipe that you have or a poem that you make of some sort. So we just want a degree of creativity. All right. It's not allocated a huge amount of marks for it, but it's something that we want you to summarize your philosophy. So write your philosophy up first, pick out the key parts and so on. Um, you can structure it in that way, yes, but it really is up to you. Some people are using headings, so they might do, you know, what I believe about learners, what I believe about my teaching, what I believe about my environment, and so on. So you can use headings if you want to. Um, it doesn't have, I want, I've given it a little bit more open-ended for this because it's a personal philosophy, so it's going to have I in it. it it's not a straight essay. So it doesn't have to be third person because it is your personal philosophy. However, your personal philosophy at this point in your career is highly influenced by research. And that's why we need to show some references and things for it as well. All right. Jenny, any other, any other questions? Yes, Jay. Um, so I've, I'm a bit nervous because I've, I've written mine now. <laughs> I've listened to this lecture. Um, but basically I'm just wondering 
mine is kind of split up into my five pillars yep. of like, I guess what I value and how I believe children learn. Brilliant. And that's, and then integrated into that is perhaps my approach to, oh, and because I'm engaging with nature, the curriculum will be emergent and project-based. But there's not a big explanation of the emergent curriculum because I figure that's not. Not. And that's like, it's fine. just it's just like touches on community of learners. And, yep. So that's it's just kind of all together like that. And, I'm and just, that's what we want more than a segmented one. I want it to be your philosophy. So you can literally hand it to someone and they go, oh, wow, that's what you believe about early yeah. education. And you can't, and it's, there's also no like, obviously I'd love to go into pedagogical documentation and like planning and all of the stuff, but I guess the philosophy is just used to, as a framework for all of the other stuff, right? And then your first lot of planning that you do, you add your philosophy into it. So okay. then you want to see how it's reflected. Great. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah. Thanks. That's where you can bring it to life, Jay. Thank In you. That first bit of planning. All right. Now, I'm going to try and do a poll. Oh, my God. It's just taken me away somewhere. Okay. Poll one. All right, all right, add a title for this poll, online lectures. All right, do you prefer the, oh, helps if I can spell the live lecture or the recorded. I'm just doing a poll, it'll come through in a minute. Okay, pre-recorded, pre-recorded, okay, save, okay, now what I'm going to do is go launch the poll, all right, so have you got a poll that's down, the oh, there we go, yay, it worked, guys. <laughs> Okay, and it's all anonymous, so I'll ask for, oh, so we're about even. Oh, that really doesn't help me. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, dear. I didn't know whether it was going to end up one or the other. Uh, Jenny, right. yes. I have a question. Yes, Izzy. It's about this um, live or recorded. Like, I like live, but... I like say if I couldn't make the live recording, I mean the live lecture and it was recorded, would we still be, would we still be marked as not attend yet? Because like I just got offered a new job and I had to drop a unit because like she wouldn't let me just watch the lectures in my own time and it was my only class. Wow. <laughs> yeah. See, I'm like, no, that's not. I'm obviously going to do the work. Like, but yeah. now to drop a unit because like yeah i think you need oh. it's so but annoying who's what is it a studies oh. katie i was like are you serious like you're recording them like and yeah. it's my class on wednesday and obviously i'm going to take the job over yeah I'm not sure. but that was my question like yeah if if we do miss the live lecture it will still be recorded and we can still watch yeah. it absolutely it's still recorded yeah okay and so i thought what about for this unit what about if i do about half of them live and about half of them pre-recorded is that okay yeah i'll do like i've done i'll just send you so keep an eye out i'll tell you each week yep so i'll tell you each week and that way you can clarify things and then some of them because yeah 8 30 on a monday it's a bit tough isn't it guys all right, because I know I can see that um, Abby's just rolled out of bed. Liv, you look like, Olivia, you've just looked like, yeah, hey, there we go. We've got some others that look like they've just rolled out of bed as well. But that's okay. As long as you've rolled out of bed, sat vaguely upright and turned your computer on, you're all good. <laughs> I agree, Lauren, being able, that's why I wanted to do this one beforehand, before your assignment to clarify stuff. 
Now, next week, we, I think I've planned to do a pre-recorded one. All right. So next week will be pre-recorded. And in our tutorials, we can clarify the personal philosophy stuff. Is that okay? All right. But I just wanted to go through this part now with the personal philosophy. So that way you felt confident to write it over the next week. Because some of you have probably started to draft it. Some of you are not really sure. And hopefully you'll be able to draft it over this week. And Jay said she's written almost all of hers. Who's written theirs just about fully? Give me a hands up or a wave or something. Yeah, no. <laughs> who's, who started some drafts, written a few things down? All right, we've got a few of those, okay? And anybody not started anything yet? Are you you're waiting? Yeah, so that's why I thought if I did this lecture that focused on it, plus I put the rubric up, plus we're going to do some more stuff in tutorials today, but next week we're not doing stuff on your personal philosophy in the tutorial, we're moving on to the next lot of topics. Is that okay? But we'll obviously answer any questions. Ah, oh, you're away for the next couple of weeks. Okay, well, that makes sense. You've then got to get your act together a little bit more. Yes. All right. Um, now, oh, the other thing that Lee and I were talking about was we think we'll add one more on-site tutorial. I know that may be a bit of a pain for you, but we're thinking, you know, the one in the school holidays, that's between your first teaching and your second teaching. We're going to do that one on uh, on campus as well so you and your group can work together and we can help you with the planning does that sound okay so i'll send what date oh that will be tori let me zoom through my calendar i'll just move my calendar out so it's not being recorded on everything week nine week 10 week 11 12. so it will be the fifth oh crap i'll let yeah well that's all right it's not our long weekend. It's the Eastern State Snog Weekend. So it'll be October the 5th and October the 6th. So whether you've got the Monday or the Tuesday. So we'll do that one on campus as well. Now, I know the on-campus ones are a tricky thing though, aren't they? Because you've got tutorials with Tracy. So what I'm wondering who... I'm wondering if we can even do... Yeah, we'll see. Because Tracy might even be able to... Yeah, we'll see if we can get, you can stay in the room that we're in for Tracy's tutorial or something like that. Okay. We'll see what we can do. Okay. Alrighty. So I'll um, update those in an announcement. Uh, what, what will be on campus? Oh, the, um, we've got our one that's week seven on campus, and then we're going to do another one in week 10 on campus as well as then the school ones that are 9, um, 11 and 12. Okay, but I'll put all the, I've got to just confirm dates with the schools and then I'll put that all in an announcement. So then the dates at the schools are completely non-negotiable. Whereas the dates at uni, as long as your group is happy, we would love you to be there, but I know that some of you may end up with something else happening. Okay, all right, everyone all right? Jenny, I just got a quick question. Yes, Amy. Um, yeah, this might sound a little bit silly. I'm not really tech savvy, but um, with the the philosophy, like underneath for the picture thing with all of our like highlight, um, do like do we do that on Word? Like, do we just get a, a photo or something to put on? Like, how's it? Um, so I think something that might work really well if you've used Canva at all. So Canva's online and you can make an infographic on Canva or you could put things and so on. So, and then you just save it as a picture and pop it on the bottom. Okay. So that's Canva. Yep. Canva. C-A-N-V-A. Canva. -A -N -V -A. Okay, I'll check that out. <laughs> yep. And then the other one that I have people do is just using PowerPoint, you know, where you can put like a picture and then you can put different yeah. things coming off it, take a screenshot or save it as a picture and put that on the bottom of your um, at your main part of your philosophy. Okay, yes, no, that makes a lot of sense. It sounds a bit silly question now, but yeah, thank you. No, no, not at all. It's something I've had to clarify with a few people because Turnitin will only accept one, I only like it to have one submission because otherwise it's a pain in the butt to try and mark. 
So that way you can make your essay, put your references, and literally on the last page, put your little infographic of some yep. sort. Okay. Thank you. All right. So everyone else okay? All right. This will give, give you enough time to go and go the ladies, grab yourself another cuppa and get ready for Tracy's lecture. Is that correct? All right, guys. So I will do pre-recorded next week. Is that all right? And so then you can watch it in your own time and I'll put it up Sunday afternoon. So that way you can watch it Sunday night. Okay. It was good. I had, I think 50 something people watch the last one. So remember that the content that's in the lectures, we don't have an exam, but it's content that we need to have embedded in your assignments. All right. And I think it's great. We don't have an exam. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah. All right, my dears. Thank you for a lovely time. I will see you all next week and I'll see some of you in an hour's time. All right. Thank have you. Fun. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Jen. so much, Jenny. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Bye, darling. Thank you.